Okay, I think uh, we're going to have some other people joining while we start. Um, so I'd like to get this uh, starting and uh, thank you very much for everyone who's joining us already. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us on this uh, webinar for software engineering for Japan market. Um, today's speaker will be myself. Uh, my name is Elalia. I am a specialist recruiter for IT infrastructure engineering in Tokyo for the past nine years. Um, additionally, we will have Maxime Perret, who is software engineer recruiter for enterprise technology and fintech. We also have joining us Shajiga Erden Bileg, uh, who is a software engineer recruiter for banking and financial services. And finally, we have Philippe Charu, who is specialized recruiter in embedded and software AI space. So today's webinar is going to be a four part presentation that will cover four specific points. First, market trend. Second, upskilling. Third, AI use, tips and benefits. And finally, a QA and a session where we'll have the opportunity to listen to some of your questions. Before we get on to the presentation, um, I'd like to do a brief overview of Hayes Business Globally. We cover markets in the US, Latin America, Europe, Asia and uh, Pacific, Australia and New Zealand. We have about 11,000 um, 11, employees globally, and we cover about 20 specialisms um, across the board. Now for Japan, we have about 250 consultants in Tokyo offices, Yokohama and Osaka. We cover about 13 specialisms, including sales and marketing, life science, banking, insurance, and obviously information technology. Information technology is one of our biggest specialism with over 50 recruiters specialized in uh, permanent recruitment, temporary recruitment, contract hacking and services, and also bilingual recruitment and domestic Japanese recruitment services. Thank you. Um, so I will now hand over the presentation to Maxime, who will be covering the current market trends in software technology for Japan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Elalia. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so, as it could have been mentioned, my name is Maxim. I'm covering uh, software engineering for tech and fintech companies. So, during this uh, market trends uh, part, we will first elaborate around the languages and the technologies that are the most used, uh, as well as the job and industries where most of the jobs will be, um, and finishing with salaries and opportunities for foreigners. Regarding the languages, so, of course, it's a bit spread. In Japan market can be a bit different for, uh, let's say like from the most Western part of the world. Um, for example, here, the main language used is JavaScript. There is multiple reasons about that, not only on the front end or anything, just even for the full stack, we will find a lot of companies uh, being based on a like TypeScript stack, JavaScript and TypeScript stack. Um, after that, so this, uh, this graph is showing what people are the most using, not only on a professional capacity, but also on a personal projects or anything. So we see also Python, uh, we will see TypeScript, of course, uh, Shell, Ruby on Rails, uh, and different other uh, languages such as like Java or uh, SQL. The main framework used for JavaScript in Japan would be React. Um, Angular being the least popular and uh, Vue being quite much used as well. We see appearing these days a bit more uh, svelte, but it remains uh, quite uh, a minimal use. For uh, Ruby on Rails, for all the web companies in Japan, it is one of the preferred language. It will be definitely a lot of opportunities for people using this language um, for being for server side or for web development. We will also uh, find some Django framework for Python in addition of uh, Laravel for PHP, but compared to the rest of the world, Japan doesn't use that much PHP. Like companies here are not using it that much. We will find more companies using uh, like Java or uh, .NET. Regarding the market trends on the salaries, so it is once again, a bit spread. Uh, let's say that for from junior to senior, it will go from like, I'd say the entry level will often receive about 3.5 and 4 million. And the most senior engineers fully hands-on can expect to have uh, between 15 and 20 million. For the senior engineers, it is a bit more spread just because it will depend a lot on the type of industry. It will depend a lot on the type of language you're using and of course your specialization. Um, we can see, for example, on the graph below that Rust is 
the language that is paying the most. That said, the number of Rust opportunities in Japan are uh, not yet uh, on a big number, and we you have way more chances to get a high salary being using like uh, like Java or Kotlin, uh, be it for Android development or in backend for like more like bigger institution. We often observe that in uh, banking or very big financial companies, the salary range might uh, be a bit higher than in like web uh, companies, uh, just because the type of system they use is a bit more specific and the talent might be a bit more rare. What we observe the most uh, based on the salary guide that Hayes is doing every year is that uh, there is kind of a, a difference between the back end and the front end engineers in terms of salaries. Front end tend to pay from three to 12 million, whereas back end would be paying from three to 14 million. Once again, all these ranges are an average and we will always uh, find um, differences based on the language level, based on the company, the industry, and the uh, programming language you're using. That said, definitely once you reach a senior engineer level in Japan, you will more often be proposed some tech lead or engineer manager position that will tend to pay a bit more than uh, just a senior engineer uh, for a long time as it can be done in uh, European or American countries. A full stack engineer is uh, what is the most let's say required in Japan at the moment. Uh, just, you know, many companies call a full stack, just a backend engineer that can do a bit of front end that just don't use much specialized front end engineers. Um, that said, we can also see a lot of uh, senior backend, pure senior backend and pure senior front end roles arriving. This arrive a bit more on the seniority. Regarding more AI side and robotics, we can see like computer vision engineers being a bit higher pay when they are on the entry level. Uh, but like a computer vision would kind of stop around 12 million once you reach a certain level of seniority. Uh, robotics will be on the same level of pay, embedded a bit lower, and AI can tend to pay a bit higher, especially these days where we can begin to see appearing a lot of like prompt engineers or different uh, new jobs being created by the different uh, AI tools that will be a bit more detailed in the following of the presentation. I will now uh, give the hand to Shashka that will uh, speak a bit more about upskilling in Japan. Thank you, Maxim. Uh, I'm a specialized consultant on software engineering roles in financial institutions such as banks and insurance. Um, as you all know, the field of software engineering is very dynamic and constantly transitioning. So upskilling helps you to stay updated with the latest technologies, tools, and programming languages. It also not only ensures your skills to remain relevant and in demand in the job market, it also helps you to position yourself for promotions and salary increase. Uh, in order to remain in step with the rapid changes, you as a software engineer is in need to prioritize and have strategic approach in continuous development and learning. Uh, in the next slide, uh, you will see the result of survey that you took when you registered for this uh, webinar. So the results, uh, you know, you can also take the notes um, and uh, from here, how, how most of you develop your skills as a software engineer. Uh, you can see also it shows us that most of you use online and uh, university classes and 50% uh, of you already started using GPT chat in search for knowledge and more than 25% um, percent are, are using uh, Stack over, uh, Overflow. Uh, also, in the next slide, I will present uh, insights on the tools and certifications for upskilling. So, depending on your career goal and work preference, you can choose programming language or tool or certificates to pursue for your professional growth in software development. For example, like um, many, if 
software engineers uh, that wants to have uh, um, has a passion to work in cutting edge technologies it would be good to follow the trend and develop or obtain a certification for machine learning ai cloud based solutions such as aws azure google cloud uh, also getting popular nowadays devops tools um, such as kubernetes jenkins and jit is highly desired for automation javascript as um, maxim explained the framework uh, like uh, react angular or vue.jp uh, is good to also um, to to catch up and uh, cybersecurity mobile development and data engineering are the most uh, recent um, skills that needs to be trending skills also in case you are eager to increase your salary, I recommend you to download and check our recently published Hey Salary Guide for 2023 from our website. Also, what Maxim explained about it on his presentation. But lastly, uh, if you are interested in becoming a software architect or technical lead, uh, not want to be much anymore on hands on coder, it will require you to develop both technical architectural skills and soft skills from technical point of view, uh, system design patterns, architectural styles such as microservices or event-driven architecture, technical PM skills, cloud and security architecture, domain-driven design, to be proficient in CI, CD, like continuous integration and continuous deployment practice with tools like Jenkins, GitLab, Azure, etc. So in regard to the soft skills, uh, it's equally important to develop strong leadership, effective communication and mentoring capabilities to be successful architect, technical leader or, an, or even an uh, engineering manager. So thank you. And next, uh, Philip will present you for AI tips and benefits. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Shachka. Um, thank you all for joining again. Um, and thank you for uh, listening to us today. So um, as they both mentioned, um, Maxim and Shachka, uh, upskilling and the type of uh, stacks and uh, experience and tools that you're using will be important. So first of all, we will go through the result of the survey uh, that you guys took, um, kind of trying to think about how AI can help you uh, in your career, um, and then uh, how it can be helpful for you in terms of job hunting. So let's go to the next and see. Um, all right. So good data here uh, from you thank you thank you all for answering almost all the questions every time that we ask you it's very good to have your cooperation uh, so we had 25 percent of you that are using ai tools every day at their job um, which is quite um, on the low side, I, I expected, uh, you know, a higher number personally, um, but a good sign is that at least uh, half of you uh, using it at a few times per week um, for job tasks. So, you know, I understand that like you cannot use it for all your tasks, but uh, it's good that you're using it sometimes. Um, and then ChatGPT is the big, big uh, king in terms of tool, 80% uh, of you uh, using that tool, especially um, when you are using any AI tool. Um, and then 30% of you never used any AI tool at work. So um, maybe it's because your company or your corporation uh, has decided to ban it or to not encourage you to use it. Um, or maybe it's just that, uh, you know, you never had the time or the curiosity so far. Um, so let's see. Um, I'm hopefully uh, whether you are in the group that use it every day or never, you will find some interesting information in the next slides. So first of all, how can you use AI for your career? So for the ones of you who are using it every day, I'm sure you can already uh, identify how how it can help you uh, in order to uh, either upskill or in order to just make your job uh, easier or faster. Uh, for the ones of you that never used it, um, that question was more towards you. Uh, so for example, you can think about it uh, as 
a tool for really self-learning and self-development first, um, if you couldn't really identify things that you can use it for specific work tasks. Um, so for example, um, if you think about how to use it for your career, um, I will try to explain to you how it can maybe increase your salary in the future using it for upskilling or um, you know how you can also use it for personal reasons as well to have some fun. <laughs> so first of all, uh, the tips and benefits, let's see um, the big main thing for those of you who didn't use uh, AI tools or never used ChatGPT or any other uh, large language models is that they have information on anything. Um, of course, the free models uh, don't necessarily have an access to the latest information, um, but if you upgrade to um, you know, the latest uh, version of, for example, ChatGPT, um, it's pretty much updated information. Um, one thing that is you need to keep in mind is that um, it's not because ChatGPT says it that it's 100% right, right? Um, it's used it's using data that was on the internet uh, for the past years, uh, and as we all know, there's also some things that are wrong <laughs> on the internet. So, but you can use it for sure uh, in order to learn some things. Um, for example, in terms of your personal or um, time-saving thing that maybe not directly related to work, is you can easily summarize any book, for example. Um, you don't have the time to read a book. Uh, you can easily get a summary of uh, you know, the key teachings of the book, uh, the key content, uh, things like that. Um, and then, uh, in order to get better for job hunting specifically, um, for example, you can prepare for interviews. Um, so let's say, as we saw previously in, in Maxim's presentation, um, Let's say you want to try to change your industry or get into a new industry, for example, gaming, and you are a back-end developer. Um, you can easily ask uh, to, to have a set of questions uh, tailored for that interview preparation. So, for example, you can write exactly that in ChatGPT as a prompt. Uh, so give me 10 questions to prepare for an interview as a back-end developer in the gaming industry. Um, and then you could try around. Uh, for example, you can ask 20 or 100 uh, and it will give you <laughs> every time something new. Uh, you can also try with adding the country where you want to have it. Uh, so, for example, gaming industry in Japan or gaming industry at this specific company. Um, so it can also help you to rewrite your experience. Um, you know, maybe you've been in touch with us in the past or, uh, you know, maybe you ask an advice from a friend uh, about, you know, maybe your CV was not exactly the right way. That's the feedback that you received. Uh, let's say you have a paragraph that is not easy to, to read, uh, you can easily put that and ask ChatGPT to sum it up uh, to make it for um, job hunting purposes or for business purposes. Um, and that, that can really help you and save you time. Um, then uh, in terms of overall tips, uh, let's say you have an offer meeting or let's say you have a meeting in face to face and you, that's your first time in Japan that you change your job, for example, and you never done that, it was all online before, then you can easily ask, um, what about um, the business culture uh, in terms of the business manners? If you go to a face to face meeting in Japan, it can give you some help uh, as well and you know, give you some indications. Uh, then gathering info about the targeting company, that's very useful. Uh, you know, most of the interviews uh, that you can have in Japan, uh, they will ask, ask you about why are you interested to join this company? Why are you interested in us? Um, well, then you can easily find a lot of information about why that company is successful, why uh, are they known for, um, and, uh, you know, more details about their history and things like that all, all at once as it will gather from all the sources available. So that's a very big time-saving thing. Uh, in terms of the big players, uh, of course, we have OpenAI. Uh, they are the, the, that's the company doing ChatGPT. That's the company behind ChatGPT. Then you have uh, Google DeepMind. Uh, so they have Google Bard. Uh, some of you are using Bard, uh, which is, uh, I think, interesting. Probably in the future, more people will use it, depending on the next few updates. Uh, same for ChatGPT. Um, OpenAI is also doing mid-journey, uh, so for image generation, and I think one of the biggest uh, and, and funniest player uh, against them is Stability AI. Uh, so that's not 
directly for job hunting because that's image generation uh, or video generation. But uh, that's a fun thing. If you want to discover AI and you're not sure, um, you can create a free account somewhere on, on Stability AI, for example, and you can test image generation. Um, so that's it for me, guys. Um, at this point, uh, we would like you to move to the Q&A session. So if you have any question and things like that, please let us know. We will try to answer you the best as possible. Thank you, everyone. If you'd like to ask a question, I think you can raise your hand through the chat, or if you prefer to write the question in writing, please write the question in the chat and we will try to get to it. Um, we will, might not be able to answer every single question. We apologize for that in advance, but we will do our best to answer as many as possible and as accurately as we can. Thank you. So we, we leave it to you guys. Okay, we have one person uh, who submitted a question through the chat, so I'll read it for everybody. Give me a quick second. Yes. Hi, my name is uh, Niti Sharma with 19 years of experience. How much salary can I expect uh, with that uh, in Japan? I will leave it to Maxime or Philippe. Uh, could you give me a bit more detail about the kind of specialization you have? Because it can be different based on that. <clears throat> but overall, with 19 years of experience, what will be the most uh, defining factors will be uh, the management experience, language skills, and uh, also the kind of positions you want to have. If it's a full hands-on uh, type of positions or if it's something a bit more on the management leadership side, um, like let's say an engineering manager would be expecting with 19 years of experience, would be expecting something around uh, between 15 and 20 million, I would say. Uh, once again, yeah, project management, cloud technologies, uh, I'm N2 certified and healthcare experience. So uh, with that, I can already tell you, like, it would be depending on the industry you choose. Uh, for example, let's say a big healthcare company, like a big life science company, uh, could definitely pay an engineering manager or let's say a CTO level type of candidate or just, you know, a project manager. It will be between, let's say, it's a wide range, but between like 12 and 18, uh, de definitely depending on the role, a project manager, maybe around 15 million, while engineering manager slash CTO more yeah, in the upper side, like more around 18 million. I hope I could answer your question. Thank you, Maxime. Uh, next, we have Amal Shiwanta. Uh, a good session. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm Amal from Sri Lanka. May I know a good CV format to match with Japan industry? Who would like to answer this question? Should you go? Um, thank you, Amal, uh, for you know software uh, engineers to format the CV. I know um, majority likes to separate the project, you know, their projects that they were being involved from the part that they, the companies they were uh, hired for that project. So uh, my um, definite advice would be mostly combine that part. Like uh, if you write down the name of the company and years of uh, work and also the title, which you were software engineer, then software engineer, and uh, on that line uh, under it to give the projects that you've been working and also add the technical skills you've been using for each um, project you were involved. Also, the industry coverage would be good um, to know because I understand sometimes in the project, if you've been in the client side, uh, you don't need to name the name of the client. So uh, also just to, from the start, it's a basic information of uh, your full name and home address with uh, contact information like um, phone number or email address. After that, just give a summary of your profile and skills. 
um, that you um, used previously, practical, and then your work experience. And in the end, it uh, would be good to have your uh, educational background, which university also years of participation. And then um, finally, to have the information on awards you have, also the um, certifications you had and uh, language skills you have also what level are those. I hope I covered your uh, question and if you have any, any other question, please let me know. Thank you, Shachika. Uh, next, we have a question from Akanksha Dawale. Uh, hi, my name is Akanksha. I have been searching for a job through Hayes. I even get a response from Hayes recruiters, but when I try to reply to them or call, I hardly get a response. Please help me with it. So yeah, we apologize if you know we don't get in time in response with people. We receive uh, thousands and thousands of uh, support requests from all over the world. We get candidates from Europe, US, literally everywhere so it's very hard to get through to everyone on time and to reply to everyone satisfaction we do try our best to follow up as much as we can but uh please you know forgive us for anyone that we might have you know got back in time um early on and uh we will try to get to you uh dawale san um and see if we can support you uh but please understand that we receive thousands of requests every day and uh, we we don't get a chance to go through every single one of them, um, but we we are trying to improve that and and get back to everyone as much as we can. Thank you for your understanding. Um, next is uh, Matthew Doty. I have four and a half years of experience uh, recruit uh, experience sorry as a full stack role using Java and TypeScript. I'm fluent in English, but only basic in Japanese. Would this be enough experience for a company to want us to want to sponsor a work visa for? Um, guys? I'll take this one uh, and I will answer at the same time the one from um, Indra Mani. So regarding, I think it's an inter interesting question. Thank you for that. So regarding the visa sponsor in Japan, um, one, one first element I'd like to uh, mention is that to get a, a work sponsored visa, there is minimum requirements that are set by the Japanese government. So it is not about will a company sponsor me or not. It's already you have to fit into some cases. So first off, to get a work sponsored visa in Japan, you need to have at least a bachelor's degree. Without academic qualifications, even with sometime eight, nine years of experience, your application can be rejected. We recently had the case with a candidate that had an offer with a company who wanted to sponsor him and that got rejected because he didn't have academic degree, even he had five, six years of experience. So first thing first, you need to have an academic degree. On the second hand, if you don't have an academic degree, at least 10 years of experience. That is a requirement that they set. Sometimes it might be unfair, but overall that is the legal requirements that they have. And even if the company wants to hire you, they might not be able to get the acceptation of your certificate of employment. That said, um, usually that you speak fluently or not Japanese might not always really uh, have influence on if you can or cannot have a job in Japan. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind is that it is way easier to get a sponsor once you're already in Japan and that you are already having an activity here than uh, if you are overseas because you one thing that uh, it is important to keep in mind is that companies want to hire people quickly and a visa sponsorship can often takes up to two to three months so let's say that your application might not be prioritized compared to candidates that are already in japan or already have a, a valid uh, visa or a working title so one important thing is to keep in mind all these conditions, the academic degree, the years of experience, and also we could uh, show in the first slides of this meeting uh, that I presented the kind of languages that were the most used in Japan, the kinds of work frameworks and technical C's that were the most used. Um, it is also interesting to maybe try to fit within this programming language and try to learn them if you are not using them. Um, especially I'm thinking like a lot of French candidates reach out to me. They're using a lot of PHP. There is very few opportunities for PHP engineers in Japan. So it can be a bit tricky for this kind of candidate, right? So you want to uh, make sure that you work on these technical skill aspects. And also, of course, you have way, way 
way more chances to have a job if you speak a business level of Japanese in Japan than without. Even though it's possible to find a job with just speaking English, Japanese level is a skill that is that needs not to be overlooked. I hope I could answer the question. Thank you, Maxime, for that. Um, well, related to that as well, Yip, uh, sorry, Yip Ho Lam. Hello, I'll be taking N1 this Sunday, but I don't think I will get it. Is it really worth uh, it to push it through N1? Um, I can give my experience uh, on this point. Uh, generally, candidates who or who have um, certified N1 level in Japanese tend to get through interview process uh, more I wouldn't say easily, but much better. And also this is uh, taken into account when the candidate receives an offer. So depending on the communication skills, whether it's fluent, business, uh, conversational, the salary can vary a little bit. Of course, not dramatically, but it will be taken into account. Uh, so it's always uh, better to try and get N1. I would say probably minimum N2. That's some of the main requirements that we get from uh, our uh, clients and our hiring managers. They they need someone who can communicate uh, at an N2 level, which is business level. N1 is usually better. So you have way more chances of getting interviews and getting through processes if you have an N1 level uh, certified in Japanese. So I hope that answers your question. So yeah, please please keep going and and try gambate for N1. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, if I can ahead. I can add something about that. Um, uh, the big difference between N2 and N1 is is not huge when you are only targeting very foreign company or younger company that already have you know a, a bunch of foreign engineers in the team. Um, that's a big difference though um, when you reach N1. It means that basically even more domestic companies that are not very used to hire foreigners uh, will not overlook your application and, and will be willing to talk to you. So it's not a big, big difference in, in terms of like the, the pure skill, I think, uh, to just get the certificate, even though you, you couldn't practice well or maybe you self-studied or things like that. But at least the company pool that you can apply for uh, is much wider. Uh, so if on a pure uh, statistic perspective, you definitely increase your chances to do it. So uh, as Elia said, gambate. <laughs> if I can add one last thing as well, I saw uh, multiple candidates in the past uh, failing interview processes because yes, they had JLPT N2, but ne they never really trained to pass interviews in Japanese. They never really trained their conversational skills overall. It is important to have a GLPT N2, but it is, so, it, it is also very important to train your business Japanese orally, like uh, with if you can find a conversation buddy or just, you know, train online. There is a lot of tools now that can help you. Definitely a great point. Maxime, thank you. Uh, next question we have is uh, from Carlos. I'm currently learning Japanese and I am about to take N5 level. With a few years of development experience, aside from learning new tech, should I also aim to learn Japanese in order to land a job there? Um, I would say probably yes, keep going on learning Japanese. That's definitely a plus. Um, it always sets you apart from candidates who don't speak any Japanese. You have more opportunities to get interviews if you are a business level of Japanese. Um, I would say also keep going with your development experience. I don't know the specifics of your personal experience. In some cases, we have companies that uh, are willing to interview candidates even without Japanese, depending on their experience level, their language skills, and of course, if they fit the job that they're looking to hire for. Um, so it, again, it, it depends on the situation. It depends on which job and which company you're applying for. Um, generally, big, big companies are open to consider candidates from overseas who don't have uh, Japanese skills if they are very technical and if they match their specific requirements at that time. So it depends, right? I hope I answered that, Carlos. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Singh Jitendra Pratap. Hi, I'm Jitendra. I have worked with Hayes uh, Japan earlier, have 18 years of experience and currently studying to get an executive MBA in English and Australian degree. How can it impact my career growth in Japan? Um, Philippe, Maxim, Shachiga. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Jitendra. Um, your experience in uh, 18 years plus experience it's in Japan and uh, it really depends on like uh, what you want to uh, you know pursue in career for example executive MBA degree in English probably um, it's a little bit away from technology but as mentioned 
before, like on one of my slides, that uh, if you are planning to be an engineering manager or to be an architect, then definitely the um, MBA with the you know negotiation skills and uh, communication skills, leadership skills uh, might help you to lead to that uh, kind of uh, position. Um, but it really depends where you want to see yourself in the next five to ten years. Thank you. Thank you, Shachika. Uh, next question, we have a uh, question from Win Het. Win Het, sorry. Um, I have experience as a telecom engineer for over five years in Myanmar, I'm now seeking for job opportunities, and then I would like to also change my career life to embedded and PLC because uh, I graduated as an electronic and communications engineer. Which job is more suitable for me and meets my goal first? Please advise me um, uh, to apply for the job. Uh, at Hayes or through Hayes. I think this is more related to Philippe, embedded side. Yep. Uh, thank you so much for the question. Um, so one of the big issue or difficulty with uh, embedded overall is um, that all the companies uh, develop very unique products, uh, whether you are an embedded for automotive, for telecom, let's say IoT maybe. Um, the, the main issue is that they will look for candidates with the exact same experience or uh, very, very closely related. Um, you know, it's not for in our area, in telecom, in, in, in embedded software, um, the language, uh, the programming language that you use doesn't really matter. It's the experience of which type of product have you developed with that. So for example, you cannot really, it's not because you're doing C++, it's not because you're doing, um, you know, telecom that you can, um, go to any telecommunication company or any uh, company that are using C++, let's say robotics, automotive, etc. Um, so it's it's a bit difficult to change uh, careers or industry or type of product um, when you are in embedded. Um, so it's a tricky move. Uh, I feel like um, you might need to sacrifice, uh, for example, on the salary side or things like that, uh, in order to, even if you are very good with the tools that you've been using, companies will be just a bit um, uh, less inclined to hire people who discover a new product or, or discover um, a new industry for embedded. So uh, as long as you keep your your mind open and kind of same as what Shashka said for the previous, uh, previous question, it's about how do you see yourself in the next, uh, you know, few years, right? Um, so uh, as long as yeah, you keep your the mind open, uh, I feel like that's the best. Uh, that's the best way. And then also in that mind, um, you know, keep trying to apply to some some companies. Of course, um, uh, you know, sometimes overall, I think all of us uh, we receive that uh, we we hear um, that candidates are a bit scared to apply to companies. To be honest, it's not a big deal to try. Uh, you know, so um, in embedded, for example, if you if there's a position that matches, uh, you know, just just try it um, and and then let's see. But yeah, I hope I answer your question. Thank you. Oh, okay, it's free. Uh, we have a Sorry question about here uh, yeah. about cover letters and about um, like why my CV is not shortlisted in Japan. Uh, I'll group that. So basically, so cover letters in Japan, not the most popular thing. Uh, let's say, let's just dig in directly, not the most popular thing. That said, if your cover letter have a really big added value, to your application, definitely uh, it might be seen. What I will say though, is that if you're applying to English only speaking positions, this position through job boards gets hundreds, if not thousands of applications. So they won't take the time to read your cover letter. Definitely. Uh, I'm grouping it with the why uh, my CV is not shortlisted in Japan with having an N5 level because Basically, once again, it goes on English only speaking uh, positions to pass the screening and anyway to get shortlisted on an application in Japan, you need to uh, kind of have point of interest highlighted strongly on your CV. 
you need to bring to show that you can bring something added compared to the other candidates. If we if you have an N5 level, it basically means that you have a basic Japanese level. You have an introduction, which is already very good. But for these kind of positions, if you don't have an N3 or an N2, they will overlook your Japanese level because it is not really an added value for now. That says it's already a very beginning. And if you continue to push on on the Japanese level, already N3 begins to be a bit more considered and N2 definitely well considered. Um, to, to finish on that is um, you need to take in consideration that if they want especially to hire a candidate from overseas, you need to show that you can bring something that they cannot find on the current market, the local market, because they will need to go through a visa sponsorship. They will need to wait a bit more to have you onboarded than for a candidate that is already available. So definitely, I think it is important to look at your CV and your application and to think from a hiring manager point of view, if I was looking for a candidate like me, what would I like to see and what kind of skills that you have that other candidates might not have can I highlight? Thanks. Uh, adding to Maxim on the cover letter, I think it's also very important and good to put the uh, you know, brief um, profile summary on the CV. And you can there write down what are your experienced uh, technical skills as well as how you can contribute to the company. It's a short message that uh, gives a brief understanding of you and it's uh, definitely someone can have a look at it. Thank you, Shetska. Uh, one last question. Can you tell me the Hayes hiring process? Um, if you go to our Hayes website, you should be able to uh, navigate and find the answer. I'm sorry, we don't have a lot of time to go through all the details, but uh, there is a link there uh, if you are interested in considering joining Hayes or applying to, through Hayes. Uh, but please go to the Hayes website, hayes.co.jp, and um, you should be able to find a link there to to. Uh, give you information on that topic. Uh, obviously, we are reaching the end of uh, this presentation. We're about 45 minutes in, so we really would like to thank you all very much for joining us during lunchtime or during morning time, wherever you guys are. Um, we're in Japan here, so it's 12.45, uh, but we really appreciate your time and also um, your questions and listening to our presentation. It's really important for us to share that kind of information to our candidates. And uh, we really like to interact as much as possible, um, you know, in this kind of format. So it's very, very uh, positive, uh, I hope, for you guys as well uh, who joined us. Um, if you'd like to uh, know more about Hayes and the uh, material that we usually publish, we have Hayes Salary Survey Guide, we have Hayes Global Index, we have information related to other points, not just necessarily technical technology, but also uh, DNA of a CFO. We also have another one called DNA of a CIO. We also have a journal quarterly report on uh, global index skills. So please don't hesitate to visit us um, at haze.co.jp or follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, you see here there is the QR code for our LinkedIn page. Um, but you, if you just type in uh, on LinkedIn Haze, you should be able to find us very easily and uh, contact us or get through uh, to any of us here. Please don't hesitate to, um, you know, add us to your contacts uh, through LinkedIn. And we hope to hear from you soon, support you as much as we can. Uh, we hope we have answered as many of your questions and you've had time to, you know, really take into account presentation from Maxime, Philippe and Shachika. Uh, we really appreciate everyone's time. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah, we hope to hear from you soon. Please get in touch with us. Thanks so much. Thank you, thank very, you much, very much.